This is Dr. Michael Morwood uh, from the Hoffman Arthritis Institute, and today we'll be demonstrating the TJO Classic Cementless Knee System. Begin by making a slightly curvilinear incision so as to avoid an incision directly over the apex of the patella or the tibial tubercle. Today we'll be doing a subvastus exposure. Sharp dissection is taken down to the level of the vastus fascia. A tonsil clamp is then used to identify the intermuscular septum, and the body of the vastus medialis is then reflected laterally. The arthrotomy is then completed at a 90 degree horizontal to the patella and down inferiorly. The knee is extended and the patellar clamp is used to evert the patella. Towel clamp is placed superiorly to aid in exposure. Bovi cautery is then used to perform an internal lateral release, feeling the pop of the lateral patellofemoral ligament as it's released. The medial sagittal ridge of the patella is then marked with the bovi and calipers are used to measure the thickness. A drill is then used to mark the medial sagittal ridge and a freehand cut of the patella is performed. The patellar cut starts at the cartilaginous junction and is taken to the midway point. Cut is then broken to verify the cut is symmetric. The planer is then used and a patellar sizing guide is placed. The button lug holes are then drilled. And a trial patellar button is placed. Given that we are doing a cementless knee, we recommend different saw blades be utilized for each of the cuts to maintain as perfect a cut as possible. At this point, the lateral patellar facet is resected with a rongeur, and the patella is allowed to subluxate laterally, and the knee is flexed. A bent home and retractor is placed medially, and a partial medial meniscectomy is performed. The retractors move more inferiorly and a medial sleeve release is performed. Medial osteophytes are then resected from both the tibia and the femur. The 
The bent home and retractor is then placed laterally in a similar partial lateral meniscectomy and lateral release is performed. No fat pad is resected at this time unless visualization is poor. Any osteophytes in the notch are then resected to allow for visualization of the PCL fibers. And the entry point for the intramedullary guide is then marked roughly five millimeters superior to the PCL fibers. A drill is used to gain access to the intramedullary canal, and the canal is suctioned to avoid any emboli. The intramedullary guide is then set on five degrees valgus cut. Given that this is a varus knee deformity and the cartilage is worn off the medial condyle, the medial side is dialed down slightly to accommodate for this. The distal femoral resection jig is then pinned in place. And the intramedullary guide is removed. Once again, a second fresh saw blade is utilized for this femoral cut. The entry on both the medial and lateral condyles are then scored while the blade is the sharpest. And the distal femur is then cut full thickness on the medial and lateral aspects. This system is set to take nine millimeters of distal femur with one millimeter extra accounting for the level of the saw blade. The blade is flipped and the cut is then polished to maximize the fit of the cementless prosthesis. The pins are then removed and the knee is flexed. Femoral sizing guide is then placed. Once again, noting that the medial femoral condyle has cartilage loss from the varus deformity preoperative. This accounts for roughly three degrees of external rotation. This is verified both by white sides line and the epicondylar axis. The appropriate four and one sized cutting jig is then malleted in place and the knee is brought to a slight extension. The body of the vastus medialis is then reflected laterally and the anterior femur is cut. Home and retractors are then placed. And the posterior condyles are cut.
a rake retractor is used to secure the cutting jig while the anterior chamfer cut is made. The posterior chamfer cuts are then made in similar fashion. And are polished with the saw once again to allow for maximal fit of the cementless system as the chamfers are typically the area where the prosthesis gets held up with any imperfections. The incomplete posterior condylar cuts are then finished with a straight osteotome. This method allows for resection of the majority of the posterior osteophytes A bone plug is then placed the ACL is resected and the knee is then brought into full flexion with the help of an industrial retractor the tibia is subluxated anteriorly The remaining lateral and medial menisci are then resected sharply. Extramedullary guide for the tibial resection is then brought in and secured. For this patient, we will be making an anatomic cut matching her preoperative varus alignment of two to three degrees. Utilizing the frog eyes style tibial jig with two long smooth pins. This allows us to match her normal anatomy. The frog eyes allow for roughly eight millimeters of tibial resection with one millimeter more for the kerf of the saw blade, two millimeters for the PCL resection as we will be using an ultra congruent uh, polyethylene insert. Given the ultra congruent polyethylene insert and the resection of the PCL, we prefer to take a little bit of slope off from the native anatomy. This allows for a more tight flexion gap. Extramedullary checker is then placed, which in a varus knee, we like to line up roughly to the tib fib ligament distally. A third saw blade is then introduced and the tibial cut is performed. The tibial wafer is then sharply resected along with the remaining PCL fibers. The wafer is then checked with calipers to verify our cut.
a tibial tray lollipop of appropriate size is then placed to maximize coverage. And the tibial pins are removed. Any residual medial osteophytes are then removed to native bone. The lollipop is then placed anteromedially to allow for maximal coverage. and the posterior medial pin is placed. The lollipop is then externally rotated, rotated to allow for maximal coverage on the lateral condyle. This thereby locks in our rotation in the correct anatomic parameter. The other pin holes are drilled. And the brooch for the tibial keel is punched. This system does allow for metaphyseal stem extensions of 50, 100, and 150 millimeters. The bone hook is used to elevate the femur and any residual posterior condylar osteophytes are resected with a curved osteotome. At this point, a posterior capsular periarticular injection is performed. Trial tibia is placed, as well as a trial insert. The knee is brought back to slight extension, and the femoral trial is impacted into place. At this point, the femur can be medial or lateralized as needed. Flexion and extension gaps, as well as patellar tracking, are then tested. And the femoral lug holes are drilled. At this point, we would normally begin to mix cement, but since this is a cementless knee, we begin to make our bone slurry. The tibial wafer is then used, and a hole is drilled in, this, in the midpoint. The patellar planer is then used to get autographed, and this is placed into a cup. The bone slurry is then placed onto the tibia and is used both as a filler for any imperfections in the cut surface as well as a biologic sealant between the tibia and the femur and the porous coating of the implants.
A bone tamp is then used as a roller pin to minimize any imperfections in the surface. And the final press fit classic tibia is then impacted. Care is taken to make sure the tibial component is being impacted both medial and laterally at the same rate as well as anterior and posterior. This is checked and final impaction is then performed. The final polyethylene insert is placed and is locked down with a screw mechanism to avoid backside wear. The industrial retractor is then flipped and the knee is brought out to a slight extension. The remaining bone slurry is then placed on the femur in similar fashion. bone tamp is once again used as a roller pin to smooth out any imperfections. The final press fit femoral component is then placed and impacted into place. Once again, care is taken to make sure the femur, femoral component is being placed equally on all sides. Final impaction is performed and the leg is brought out to full extension. The patella is once again exposed and the patellar button is removed. The patellar component is cemented into place in standard fashion. Here we're using a vitamin E poly, which is seven millimeters in thickness. At this point, the tourniquet is let down and a C-arm is brought in to take a true AP and true lateral image of the prosthesis. This verifies the cuts and the coverage of the press fit implant. Once again, this is Dr. Michael Morwood from Hoffman Arthritis Institute. And today we were demonstrating the TJO Classic Cementless Knee System.